18 years ago, I hired on as the ranch manager, and then I've owned it for three years now. It's a pretty place, uh, a lot of work, but sure. hard work gets you somewhere, I guess. So you produce uh, mostly uh, dairy quality alfalfa here? Yeah, that's our main goal here, is to produce good quality so that the cows can be milked good and, and get the proteins up there where we need them to be. And in the dairy market, they change back and forth pretty rapidly, it seems like. It's just like one dairy guy told me, he says, Mike, if I don't feed really good alfalfa hay, I could lose $10,000 a month. So what makes your hay really high quality? What What is it folks are looking for? Well, you know, you're just after a good product. I mean, you want the big leaf. We try to stay away from the hays that got the great big rough stems. Uh, it's like straw. We want to make sure that we put down the right fertilizer at the right time on the crop to get the maximum out of it. You got to have volume. You got to have the quality. It costs too much money to run a tractor across it. Uh, fuel, you think it's cheap right now, but it's still one of our biggest costs. Fertilizer is one of our very biggest. And then of course employees is the next. Um, I don't do this by myself, by no means. It takes a crew. You, you get two cuttings of hay up here in this area real easy. We need another 35 to 40 days to get really good third cut. There's years that there's a big challenge. The end result is try to put up the best hay we can. So you do nutrient testing on your hay, yes. and we all know that, uh, we know that the nutrients from in the hay all come from the soil. So what are some of your soil management practices? Well, you don't want to overgraze so that you take and cut your field down to bare dirt. Grasses in the wintertime, they grow more in the wintertime, their root system, so that they can produce grass during the summertime. The alfalfa is the same way. You take it down to where there's nothing left, um, it takes too much energy to pop it back up. We were taking soil samples and they'd come out in a truck and we'd run around to the fields and, and take our soil samples. Taking them way too deep, way too deep. Foot and a half, it's no good. So we went back up and we started going to the top three to six inches. No deeper than six inches. Your roots are right there. They're, they're not gonna go that deep if they don't have to. We did a test plot over here about seven years ago on six different varieties of alfalfa. We started looking at that and in the soil conditions, we got like six different styles of conditions out here. We got really sandy loamy. We got alkali patches. We've got places that, you know, very nice dirt now, but it's taken a while to get to the stage where we're at. The fertilizer, we've, we've went to 100% liquid and we're getting to see more a organic material in there. And not everybody can do liquid. You know, like flood irrigate fields, though, we come in, we do it, put it on in the spring, right when we need it. We know we're gonna hit it with water in a couple days or a week or something like that. You're, you come out of dormancy for the winter and your alfalfa jumps up that high as soon as the, as the sun starts to come out and starts warming up the ground. We get a freeze. Down it went, ran out of energy to get going again. So that's when we come back in and spray it at that time, and that gives it the jump that we need. Are you putting fertilizer in your in with your irrigation? Are you doing fertigation? Yeah. We just put the tank right beside the pivot pivot point, or even on the side rolls. We figure out exactly what we got under the acres underneath that sprinkler. We let it run for 15 minutes, and that whole section's fertilized. And the same thing with the pivots. You know, it works really good that way. Of course, the flood air gates, then we got to come back in and respray right after second cut. We try to hit that window about 28 days before the bugs get bad or anything. We haven't sprayed for 20 years here. You haven't um, sprayed an insecticide for 20 years? Right, you're saying? 20 years. Then, as soon as that field is harvested, baled, we're within a day or two, we got water running. And then we'll go for 28 days and not shutting the water off on that Absolutely. on a pivot. But we can still get our water down a foot mm -hmm. or better. Have I mean, you noticed as your soil's been getting healthier and increasing your organic matter and earthworms, yes. have you noticed the water's moving differently in your soil or your irrigation has changed? Yeah, it has changed. We did a lot of aerating for quite a few years. We kind of backed off from that because we're doing it in our liquid fertilizer now. It has made a world of difference, I think, on how much water we put down. I come from a place where the soil was really good, heavy clay soil. You only irrigated it three times a year. This out here, you never shut the sprinklers off. 
So now we get to shut the sprinklers off in between cuts and we're having to outrun our new growth coming back. That soil throughout the whole field is even. Before you could dig down after the water got done and you'd only be down to two inches. What we're finding out is we got lots more earthworms. You know, with the aphids and, and weevil and that stuff, we're not getting it. But we're, the reason why we don't really get them that badly here is because we cut early. We're taking that plant when it's healthy. Our soils were sandy and didn't have no organic material in them. By doing some of this no-till, we're only digging down maybe four to six inches when we rip that stuff, and we're leaving our bugs at the top. You gotta plow some things, don't get me wrong here, but we, when you take and plow really deep, you just throw all your good stuff to the bottom of the, the bucket, mm -hmm. and then you gotta rebuild all that. If you leave it up on top, your bugs are working for you every year. Before I was all year waiting for that hay to get ready to even go out and cut it. But we are definitely seeing a difference in the tons out here. Good hay is easy to sell. I love picky people and our horse people are picky, but it also means that I gotta be picky and don't send them nothing that they don't want. So walk me through a little bit more here, your, your general soil management. So you. Um, you have your fields in alfalfa or an alfalfa grass mix for several years. Yes. And then at that point, you'll, t you'll rotate it out into a beardless barley. Yes. And then back into an alfalfa. Yes. See, and like this field right here that we're standing by has got a lot of good grass in it. And we're going to come in poly this fall and we'll spray this. And we'll go across it once, come back in, hit it again. And then the next trip across, which we're only making three passes across it. Then we throw the grain drill right behind it and away we go. We'll put that bearless barley in early and I got cows so I want to feed that stuff to them. What motivated you to make some changes in soil management? Well it was the man hours. You got plowing, uh, you got to go out and disc it, then you got to go out and roll a harrow it, then you got to go out and land level it, then you got to go roll a harrow it again, and then you plant it. It's less trips, saves me time, saves me money the way I look at it. And we're not plowing so deep and throwing that stuff way down there and having to start all over again. That's what makes sense to So me. would you say your, your initial motivation was saving on some time and expenses, but what you found is the soil health's been improved yes. and that's and what's keeping you going? Get my soils back into better condition. 20 years ago, it was not the prettiest soil you ever seen. Now I'm liking it. The healthier your soil is, the better your plants grow, the easier it is to take care of. Um, Were there some upfront costs for you in terms of investing in new types of equipment or, yeah, or changing anything that way? There is. I mean, you know, it's tough. How do you do it? The first year you go either buy one tool or something like that or rent it. Just by doing what we're doing here, it's going to increase the tonnage to where you can pay for that a little bit. Half a ton to the acre, add that up over 160 acres, well, that just paid for some fertilizer big time. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who's wanting to make some changes or, or reduce their tillage maybe or change their fertilizer practices? Don't be scared of change, really. You know, we all sit there and say, oh man, I don't want to change. Everything's going good. And, but you got to keep looking and looking and seeing what you're doing wrong. When you drive by a field, don't just drive by it at 70 miles an hour. Stop and kind of look at it. Ask some of these guys around that have done it. Learn from their mistakes and what they would do and what they wouldn't do again. And you think, yeah, I don't want to look like I'm a dumb farmer or, you know, cow guy or whatever, but I'm not afraid to ask. What about the time it takes for things to, to for you to see changes in the soil and in the... You're going to see a jump the first year a little bit. You're going to see just that you maintained um, what you're, you've done in the past. The next year you're going to see a little more, but a lot more. It's not a fast process. Don't think you're just going to jump in it today and be there tomorrow. you got to build them soils back up and get your soils back into the good health. Everybody that I've talked to and everything I'm seeing, it works. As a result, you're seeing fewer passes across the field, healthier soil, better water use efficiency, and a higher quality hay product in terms of more nutrient density. I am. I really am. I had a dream, and I'm, I'm going to continue on. I'm not going to give up on my dream. It's a good change, 
and I'm not going to stop.